Chapter 4 of The Airlords of Han by Philip Francis Nolan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 Han Electrono Ray Science. At this period, the Hans of New York had only one airship equipped with their new armored repeller ray. Their latest defense against our tactics of shooting rockets into the repeller rays and letting the latter hurl them up against the ships. They had developed a new steel alloy of tremendous strength, which passed their rep ray with ease, but was virtually impervious to our most powerful explosives. Their supplies of this alloy were limited, for it could only be produced in the Lotan shops, for it was only there that they could develop the degree of electronic power necessary for its manufacture. This ship shot out towards our lines just as the last of the ground ships turned turtle and was blown to pieces. As it approached, the rockets of our invisible and widely scattered gunners in the forest below began to explode beneath its rep ray plates. The explosions caused the great ship to plunge and roll mightily, but otherwise did it no serious harm that I could see, for it was very heavily armored. Occasionally rockets fired directly at the ship would find their mark and tear gashes in its side and bottom plates, but these hits were few. The ship was high in the air, and a far more difficult target than were its rep ray columns. To hit the latter, our gunners had only to gauge their aim vertically. Range could be practically ignored, since the rep ray at any point above two-thirds the distance from the earth to the ship would automatically hurl the rocket upward against the rep ray plate. As the ship sped toward us, rocking, plunging, and recovering, it began to beam the forest below. It was equipped with a super beam, too, which cut a swath nearly a hundred foot wide wherever it played. With visions of many a life snuffed out below me, I surrendered to the impulse to stage a single-handed attack on this ship, feeling quite secure in my floating shell of inertron. I nosed up vertically and rocketed for a position above the ship. Then, as I climbed upward, as yet unobserved in my tiny craft that was scarcely larger than myself, I trained my telultroscope on the Han ship, focusing through to a view of its interior. Much as I had imbibed of this generation's hatred for the Hans, I was forced to admire them for the completeness and efficiency of this marvelous craft of theirs. Constantly twirling the controls of my scope to hold the focus, I examined its interior from nose to stern. It may be of interest at this point to give the reader a layman's explanation of the electronic or ionic machinery of these ships and of their general construction, for today the general public knows little of the particular application of the electronic laws which the Hans used, although the practical application of ultronics are well understood. Back in the 20th century I had, like literally millions of others, dabbled a bit in radio as we called it then. The science of the Hans was simply the super development of electricity, radio, and broadcasting. It must be understood that this explanation of mine is not technically accurate, but only what might be termed an illustrative approximation. The Hans power stations used to broadcast three distinct powers simultaneously. Our engineers called them the starter, the pulley, and the sub-disintegrator. The last named had nothing to do with the operation of the ships, but was exclusively the powerizer of the disintegrator generators. The starter was not unlike the radio broadcast of the 20th century. It went out at a frequency of about 1,000 kilocycles, had an amperage of approximately zero, but a voltage of 2 billion. Properly amplified by the use of inductostatic batteries, a development of the principle underlying the earth induction compass applied to the control of static. This current energized the A ionomagnetic coils on the airships, large and sturdy affairs, which operated the attracto-reflex receivers, which in turn pulled in the second broadcast power known as the pulley, absorbing it from every direction, literally exhausting it from surrounding space. The pulley came in at about half a billion volts, but in very heavy amperage, proportional to the capacity of the receiver, and on a long wave, at audio frequency in fact. About half of this power reception ultimately actuated the repeller ray generators. The other half was used to energize the B ionomagnetic coils, peculiarly wound affairs, 
whose magnetic fields constituted the only means of insulating and controlling the circuits of the three powers. The repeller ray generators operating on this current and in conjunction with twin synchronizers in the power broadcast plant developed two rhythmically variable ether ground circuits of opposite polarity. In the X circuit, the negative was grounded along an ultraviolet beam from the ship's repeller ray generator. The positive connection was through the ether to the X synchronizer in the power plant, whose opposite pole was grounded. The Y circuit traveled the same course, but in the opposite direction. The rhythmic variables of these two opposing circuits, as nearly as I can understand it, in heterodyning created a powerful material push from the earth up along the violet ray beam against the rep ray generator and against the two synchronizers at the power plant. This push developed molecularly from the earth mass resultant to the generator and at the same fractional distance from the rep ray generator to the power plant. The force exerted upward against the ships was, of course, highly concentrated, being confined to the path of the ultraviolet beam. Air or any material substance coming within the indicated section of the beam was thrown violently upward. The ships actually rode on columns of air thus forcefully upthrown. Their home berths and stations were constructed with air pits beneath. When they rose from ordinary ground in open country, there was a vast upheaval of earth beneath their generators at the instant of takeoff. This ceased as soon as they got well above ground level. Equal pressure to the lifting power of the generator was exerted against the synchronizers at the power plant, but this force, not being concentrated directionally along an ultraviolet beam, involved a practical problem only at points relatively close to the synchronizers. Of course, the synchronizers were automatically controlled by the operation of the generators, and only the two were needed for any number of ships drawing power from the station, providing their protection was rugged enough to stand the strain. Actually, they were isolated in vast spherical steel chambers with thick walls, so that nothing but air pressure would be hurled against them, and this, of course, would be self-neutralizing, coming as it did from all directions. The sub-disintegrator power reached the ships as an ordinary broadcast reception at a negligible amperage, but from one to five hundred quints, quintillions, voltage, controllable only by the fields of the B ionomagnetic coils. It had a wavelength of about ten meters. In the disray generator, this wavelength was broken up into an almost unbelievably high frequency and became a directionally controlled wave of an infinitesimal fraction of an inch. This wavelength, actually identical with the diameter of an electron, that is to say, being accurately tuned to an electron, disrupted the orbital paths and balanced pulsations of the electrons within the atom, so desynchronizing them as to destroy polarity balance of the atom and causing it to cease to exist as an atom. It was in this way that the ray reduced matter to nothingness. This destruction of the atom and a limited power for its reconstruction under certain conditions marked the utmost progress of the Han science. End of chapter 4